Hello, welcome to lecture two of History 1111 for Summer. It's Mr. Kennedy again. And we're going to pick up where we left off with the last video. And we're going to talk about ancient Sumer, which is credited as being the first true civilization. And it's going to exist for about a thousand years, from 3000 to 2000 BC. Now, <clears throat> Ancient Sumer is not really ruled by one king. It was originally a bunch of independent city-states that shared uh, the same language, same culture, same beliefs. And each of these cities was led by an NC or a governor. And uh, we don't know for sure how the NC came to power. Uh, there's some evidence that says that the NC was elected, but we don't know for sure. But what we do know is the priests were very, very powerful and very important in the Sumerian civilization. <clears throat> this was because priests were in charge of not just religion, but agriculture as well. So the priests were the intermediary between the gods and the people, and the priests told everybody when to plant, when to harvest, when to water, uh, when to do everything with agriculture. In fact, cuneiform was invented or created by the priests so that they could keep track of business transactions regarding how much food is going into the grain temples and how much was coming out. <clears throat> now what was uh, cuneiform? It was originally used for business transactions, but it's eventually used to keep and write down laws and also to develop mathematics. And remember, their mathematics system is based on the number 60. And you can see here a picture of how the cuneiform simplified over time. For example, you can see Kerr, which is mountain or land. It originally starts as three hills. Those three hills get turned on their side. Then they just become smaller and smaller triangles. Each one of those was just to make it easier and easier and easier to, um, to write. And then same thing with man and female. Uh, you can use your imagination to, to figure out what those symbols mean, but as they get newer and newer and newer, those symbols are very, very much simplified. Now, Sumerian laws were primarily about ethics and guiding ethics. One example of a law says, if a man rented an ox and damaged its eye, he shall pay one half of its price. Another one says, if a man turned his face away from his first wife, but she has not gone out of the house, his wife, whom he married as his favorite, is a second wife. He shall continue to support his first wife. So this Sumerian law is all about ethics and doing the right thing versus the wrong thing. And Sumerian proverbs kind of do the same thing. Uh, for an example, one Sumerian proverb says, into an open mouth a fly enters. And another one says, um, a singer whose voice is not sweet is a poor singer indeed. So it's all about ethics and how to be a better person. A Sumerian religion, it's polytheistic. There's multiple gods, and I can't believe I wrote multiple dogs there. That's a embarrassing misspelling. Um, but their primary gods were An, Ki, Enlil, and Shemesh. Uh, Enlil was kind of the, the most important of those. Uh, Enlil is the one who did the uh, punishment for humans if they needed it. And sometimes these gods were hostile towards humans. Uh, if it rained too much or if it didn't rain enough, the Sumerians thought their gods were punishing them. Ultimately though, this religion, it was used to help the Sumerians understand the world around them their scientific understanding was not as advanced as ours, so they used what they knew to understand the world around them. Their temples were known as ziggurats, and they were step temples. Um, <clears throat> they were in the middle of Sumerian cities, and there were rituals, per rituals performed in and on the temples that were designed to make the gods happy. Eventually, the Sumerians are going to be replaced by the Babylonians. Uh, Babylonians are going to exist from about 2000 to 1500 BC, but they existed prior to that. They just had a different name. Uh, before the 2000 
BC, they were known as Amorites. Now, as the Sumerians start to weaken, the Babylonians move into their territory and kind of uh, adopt the best parts of Sumerian life, if you will. Uh, they didn't destroy Sumerian culture, they kind of meshed with it, if you will. And <clears throat> excuse me. The Babylonians were better governed, if you will, than the Sumerians were. Uh, the most popular or the most well-known, I guess would be the better word, Babylonian leader was Hammurabi. Hammurabi lived somewhere around 1700 BC, and that's actually a picture of him seated in his throne. And Hammurabi built this strong, stable empire that was most likely the largest empire the world had ever seen up until that time. Uh, the Babylonians, they traded with their neighbors. They were very businesslike. And because they were so businesslike, uh, their legal code was very businesslike as well. And in fact, the Code of Hammurabi is one of the most important and best known legal codes of all time. The Code of Hammurabi it applies to everybody, but the punishment changed depending on where you were in life. So if you were wealthy, you were punished more harshly than if you were not. But those punishments were always seen as fair by Babylonians. There is a lot of death. There is a lot of retaliation. The Code of Hammurabi is the... the um, creation, if you will, of the idea a tooth for a tooth, a limb for a limb. Now what are some of these laws? Well, here's one. If a man has accused another man and cast against him an accusation of murder, but has not proved it against him, his accuser shall be put to death. In other words, don't accuse somebody of murder unless you can prove your case. Um, if a surgeon has made a major incision in a free man with a bronze instrument and saved the man's life, or opened an eye infection with a bronze instrument and saved the man's eye, he shall take 10 shekels of silver. You save somebody's life, you get paid for doing your work as a doctor. However, if a surgeon has made a major incision in a free man with a bronze instrument and caused him to die, or opened an eye infection with a bronze instrument and thereby destroyed the man's eye, they shall cut off his hand. That's the retaliation, the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now as far as Babylonian literature goes, uh, they were fairly well advanced for their time. The Babylonians knew how to solve quadratic equations. They kept accurate astronomical records. Uh, one example is the Tablet of Amasaduga. Um, the Tablets of Amasaduga, uh, they're actually astronomical observations of the planet Venus. Uh, it's 21 years of observations, and when NASA scientists went to look at the results of their observations, using the power of computers, they learn that the observations were accurate. The Epic of Gilgamesh becomes the first major piece of poetry. It's the first epic poem. Now what's funny about this is the Epic of Gilgamesh is actually based on a Sumerian king, but they kind of fancy up the story and make it better. I don't want to give away too much about the Epic of Gilgamesh because that is one of the readings for the first day, or for the first week I should say, but I will tell you it's an epic poem, it's a long poem, it's centered around a larger than life hero. Uh, this hero, Gilgamesh, is a very well-off king. Uh, he thinks he's the most important thing in the world. And the gods create a foe named 
Enkidu. Enkidu is this wild man who learns how to be human, fights Gilgamesh, then becomes best friends with Gilgamesh, and they go off and they have story after story after story. Now in the end, the epic Gil Gilgamesh, it's going to be used by the Babylonians to give them a shared culture. Everybody who lived in Babylonia knew about the epic of Gilgamesh. So everybody shares the same culture, the same values, the same dreams. The epic Gil of Gilgamesh helps the Babylonians understand death. And once you read it, you'll understand why. The Babylonians will be replaced by the Assyrians. The Assyrians are kind of the bad boys of the story. Uh, they exist from about 1000 BC until 612 BC. And the Assyrians, they used to be pushed around a lot. They were, they were, they were the uh, recipient of multiple invasions. Pretty much anybody who could invade them did. And because of that, the Assyrians are going to become this very warlike civilization. And everything in their society is going to be de dedicated to warfare. Uh, all their engineering techniques are going to be used to win wars. Their science discoveries are going to be used for war. Uh, for example, uh, they used astronomy to predict eclipses. And they knew that if there was a solar or a lunar eclipse, they could use that to their advantage. Uh, their god, uh, Asher was originally the god of food, the god of agriculture, but Asher is going to be repackaged as their war god. And even their art and their literature focused on war. Sometimes hunting, but war was the big deal. So what did the Assyrians do with all this warlike culture? Well, they invent the, the chariot, they use the chariot to conquer an area of land that stretched from modern day Turkey all the way to modern day Egypt. And they were very mean. They used terror to stop any revolt in its tracks. They would they were not afraid to hurt you or kill you. Now Assyrian law is very much like Assyrian culture. It's about violence and it's about war. Um, it was also very, very much about reproduction because if there was reproduction, then there could be new boys born. If there were new boys born, they could be raised to be soldiers. And if there were new soldiers, then they could expand their territory even more. So adultery was bad. Abortion was bad. Uh, homosexuality was bad, etc., etc. Here's an example of Assyrian law. If a man has caught another man with his wife and a charge is brought and proved against him, they shall kill both of them. There is no guilt for this. In other words, if a man catches his wife with another man, the man can kill both of them if he wants to. If he has caught him and brought him either before the king or before the judges and a charge is brought and proved against him, if the husband of the woman puts his wife to death, then he may put the man to death too. So if the man catches his wife with another man, he could kill them if he wants to, with permission of a judge, or not. If the husband of the woman puts his wife to death, then he may put the man to death. All right. If he cuts off the nose of his wife, he shall make the man a eunuch, and the whole of his face shall be mutilated. Meaning, the man can cut off his wife's nose to show she's an adulterer, and then he can cut off the, the other man's manly bits, if you will, and make it so he can't reproduce. Finally, if he lets his wife go free, they shall set the man free too. So the man could choose to do nothing. Lots of choices. All of the choices except for one involve some sort of violence. Here's another example. If a woman has damaged a man's testicle in a quarrel, they shall cut off one of her fingers. If she has damaged the second in the quarrel, they shall tear, tear out both of her, you guess what.
So overall, the Assyrians are not what I would call friendly. Now we have the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans also are better known as Neo or New Babylonians. Chaldeans, they take over in the year 612 and they exist not for very long, until 539, only about 100 years. Their best known ruler is a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar helps to orchestrate the overthrow of Assyria. Uh, he's the leader of the revolt, if you will. And Nebuchadnezzar tries to recreate the idea of the Babylonians, which is why they're called the New Babylonians. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to bring back all of the old laws. He's going to bring back all of the new, or all of the uh, old religion. He's going to move the capital back to Babylon. And overall, these Chaldeans, they're very wealthy, they're very powerful, they're peaceful, but the Assyrians gave these new Babylonians PTSD, basically. Uh, the, the Chaldeans are very distrustful, they're pessimistic, they're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And their civilization starts to fall apart because they keep waiting for it to fall apart. And um, the story, the end of the Chaldeans is kind of sad because uh, there's a war where the, the um, Persians attack the city of Babylon. And the final king of Babylon, his name is Belshazzar, uh, he's so full of himself that he thinks that as long as they stay inside the city, they're safe. There are walls all around the city. Uh, he doesn't prepare for the emergency at all and the city falls down the city is taken over by the persians without even mounting a defense at all uh, it gets worse from there eventually the chaldeans they're going to rebel and they're going to throw out the persians <clears throat> the leader of the persians comes back a guy named cyrus cyrus is going to surround the city of babylon and this leads to a food shortage. Now this food shortage was so bad that the Babylonians line up all of the women who were still in the city and number them off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Woman one through nine are killed. Woman ten is ordered to go bake bread for all of the men. Now, in a healthy society, that's not going to happen. Um, there's definitely something wrong with a society where the men kill their women to try and save their own lives. So that kind of gives you an idea of how distrustful, how pessimistic, and how bad the Chaldeans or the Neo-Babylonians ended up. That is like a poster for PTSD right there. All right, for this lecture video, that's all there is. Um, once again, this first week, just kind of want to ease you in with two rather short videos. Uh, next week's videos may be a little bit longer. We'll see. But if you need anything, please email, please call, please visit, and I will answer you as quick as I can or sit and visit with you as long as you'd like. Until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.